I'm very, very pleased to introduce Brittany Cavallero. Uh, Brittany was born in Springfield, Illinois, and lived there until she began studying creative writing at the Interlochen Arts Academy. Brittany earned her BA from Middlebury College, her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she's currently an English literature doctoral candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She's taught literature, creative writing, and composition to undergraduate students at the University of Wisconsin, and taught gifted high school students through a program at Northwestern University. Bree's first poetry collection, Girl King, was published in 2015, and her book, A Study in Charlotte, in the Charlotte Holmes series, was recently named a Best Fiction for Young Adults selection by the Young Adult Library Services Association, a division of the Li American Library Association. Her newest title, which we just learned today, uh, the last of August, debuted as number four on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations, Brittany. Bree's other awards include scholarships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, a fellowship from the Vermont Studio Center, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Poetry. Brittany lives with her husband and their very small, very loud cat, <laughs> and they recently moved from Wisconsin to the Bay Area. We'll talk more about uh, her book signing and, and um, the original tree worshipers of Rock County, the local Sherlockian group, um, near the end. So please um, give Bree a warm welcome. I just want to make sure this is working, which it sounds like it does. Hi, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I've been on tour for a few weeks, and so um, it is a treat to be back in Wisconsin again. I spent my 20s living in Madison, and I loved it there. Um, and this is really exciting to be back, especially talking to Sherlockians and young adult fans. And uh, these are sort of all of my happy places, and it's good to have the sweet spot right in the middle. Um, so I thought that I could start by reading to you all a little bit from the newest book. Um, I promise to read parts of it that will not spoil anything from the first book. All you really need to know is that Jamie and Charlotte did not die, and they are here for another adventure. So I'm going to steal this copy over here and read to you a little bit from the beginning. So um, if you don't know anything about the series, Charlotte Holmes and Jamie Watson are descendants of the original Holmes and Watson. Um, I play something that Sherlockians refer to as the great game, where we pretend that Holmes and Watson are real. Um, in my version, and as in many versions, um, Doyle is Watson's um, literary agent. Uh, Watson wrote the stories. So this jumps forward to present day, um, and we have a girl Holmes and a boy Watson who are at boarding school together in Connecticut. Charlotte is English. Jamie is sort of grown up with one foot on either side of the Atlantic. Neither of them is really sure why they've been there. And then, of course, they immediately get framed for murder, because that's what happens to you when you are in a young adult mystery, particularly a Sherlockian one. This book picks up after they've solved that case. Um, it's over their winter break. Um, they have gone back to the Holmes family house in Sussex. And the two of them have kind of a complicated, tumultuous relationship, so as usual, as this book opens, they're fighting. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Oh, and the books are narr narrated by Jamie Watson. It was late December in the south of England, and though it was only three in the afternoon, the sky outside Charlotte Holmes' bedroom window was as black and full as it would have been in the Arctic Circle. I'd forgotten about this somehow during my months in Connecticut away at Sheringford School even though I'd grown up with one leg on either side of the Atlantic. When I thought of winter, I thought of those reasonable New England nights that arrived punctually just after dinner, disappearing into morning blue by the time you'd stretched awake in bed. British winter nights were different. They came on in October with a shotgun and held you hostage for the next six months. It would have been better all told if I'd visited Holmes for the first time in the summer. Her family lived in Sussex, a county that hugged England's southern coast, and from the top floor of the house they'd built, you could see the sea. Or you could if you happened to own a pair of night vision goggles and a vivid imagination. England's December darkness would have put me into a mood all by itself, but Holmes's family manor was stuck up on a hill like a fortress. 
I kept waiting for lightning to break the sky above it, or for some poor tortured mutant to come stumbling out of its cellar, mad scientist in hot pursuit. The inside didn't do much to dispel the feeling that I was in a horror movie, but a different kind of horror movie, some art house Scandinavian deal. Long and dark, uncomfortable couches that weren't designed to be sat on. White walls hung with white abstract paintings. A baby grand lurking in a corner. In short, the kind of place that vampires lived in. Really well-mannered vampires. And everywhere there, silence. Holmes' rooms in the basement were the living, messy living heart of that cold house. Her bedroom had dark walls and industrial shelving and books. Books everywhere organized alphabetically on shelves or tossed on the floor with their pages flung open. In the room beside, a chemistry table crowded with beakers and burners, succulent plants twisted and knobbled in their little pots that she fed a mixture of vinegar and almond milk each morning from an eyedropper. It's an experiment, Holmes told me when I protested. I'm trying to kill them. Nothing kills them. The floors were scattered with papers and coins and busted cigarettes, and still, in all the endless clutter, there wasn't a single speck of dust or dirt. It was what I'd come to expect from her, ex except for maybe her stash of chocolate biscuits and the entire hardbound Encyclopedia Britannica, which she kept in the low bookshelf that served as her nightstand. Apparently, Holmes liked to pour over it on her bed, cigarette in hand. Today was volume C the entry Czechoslovakia, and for some unknowable reason, she'd insisted on reading the whole of it out loud to me while I paced back and forth in front of her. Well, there might have been a reason. It was a way for her to avoid talking about anything real. While she smoke, spoke, <laughs> I tried to avoid looking at the Sherlock Holmes novels she'd stacked on top of volumes D and E. They were her father's, filched from his study. We'd lost our own copies in a bomb blast this fall, along with her chemical experiments, my favorite scarf, and a good deal of my trust in the human race. Those Sherlock Holmes stories reminded me of the girl she was when we met, the girl I'd wanted so badly to know. In the last few days, we'd somehow managed to retreat backwards from our easy friendship, back to that old territory of distrust and unknowability. The thought made me sick, made me want to climb the walls. It made me want to lay it all out at her feet so we could begin to fix it. I didn't do that. Instead, in the grand tradition of our friendship, I picked a fight about something completely different. Where is it? I asked her. Why can't you just tell me where it is? It wasn't until 1918 that Czechoslovakia liberated itself from the Russo-Hungarian Empire and became the country as we know it in the 20th century. She ashed her lucky strike, on, strike out on the coverlet. Then, a series of events that transpired in the 1940s. Holmes, I said. I waved a hand in front of her face. Holmes, I asked you about Milo's suit. She batted me away during which the state did not precisely exist as it had before. The suit, I said, that definitely won't fit me, that costs more than my father's house, the suit that you're making me wear. She, she cleared her throat, until that particular territory was ceded to the then Soviet Union in 1945. She squinted down at the volume, cigarette dangling from her fingers. I can't make out the next bit. I must have spilled something on this page the last time I read it. So you reread this entry a lot, I said, a little Eastern Europe before bed just as good as Nancy Drew. Is who, she asked. No one, I said. Look, I understand you're wanting me to dress for dinner and that you can say those words with a straight face because you grew up with this level of unbearable, suffocating poshness. And I don't know, maybe you like that it makes me uncomfortable. She blinked at me, a bit stung. Every word out of my mouth today was crueler than I meant it to be. OK, fine, I said, backtracking. So I'm having a very American panic attack. But your brother's rooms are locked down more tightly than the Pentagon. Please, she said. Milo has better security than that. Do you need the access code? I can text him for it. He changes it remotely every two days. The code to his childhood bedroom, I said. He changes it from Berlin. Well, he's the head of a mercenary company. She reached for her phone. Can't have anyone finding Mr. Wiggles. Plush bunnies need the same protection as state secrets, you know. I laughed, and she smiled back at me. And for a moment, I forgot that we weren't getting along. Holmes, I said, the way I'd done so often in the past, out of reflex, as punctuation, with nothing I really planned to say after. She let the moment hang longer than was usual. When she finally said, Watson, it was with hesitation. I thought of the questions I wanted to ask her, all the horrible things I could say instead. But all I said was, why are you reading to me about Czechoslovakia? I can leave it there. Um, so you guys have just a little bit of Eastern European history, I guess, with your um, Sherlockiana. 
Um, so I thought that I could start by playing the trailer uh, for the book series. Um, this is kind of a new thing as of the last few years, this idea of making trailers for books. Some of them are like really kind of imagistic and abstract and have cool music. Um, I'm really lucky in that my best friend is a filmmaker. And so I'm probably never going to get another Christmas or birthday present from him ever again because he's been making me these um, and they're terrific. He's actually, you'll see him in this as uh, Charlotte's older brother. Um, he's very, very <laughs> fancy. They're all very fancy. Mostly my job when these trailers were being made was to stand like just off camera out of earshot and cry quietly to myself because I was so excited. Um, so I'll go ahead and play this and then um, it'll give you a little bit of a sense of the second book and then I can talk to you about it and we can do questions and all that jazz. Holmes' uncle Leander was missing and I was along for the ride. And the ride was in Europe where my best friend paid for everything and spoke German to the driver and I tried not to feel like the cargo she'd strapped to the top of the car especially when we are around Milo Holmes and his mercenary company. The government has asked our uncle to uncover an art forgery ring. For his safety, I wasn't told any more than that. August Moriarty. August Moriarty had a PhD in pure maths, a Prince Charming smile, and a brother named Hadrian who probably taught him everything he knew about wheeling and dealing stolen paintings. We will begin the bidding at 3,000 euro. Do I have 5,000? I'm not Sherlock Holmes. This isn't a case study. My uncle is missing. And the only possible answer is that it's the Moriarty's behind it. 10,000 euro. 50,000 euro. It's your mess. 75,000 euro. I'll be anything. I'll do anything, please. 85. 90. 95. Jamie. 100,000 euro. Show. This is, of course, the closest that any author really gets to having the TV show version of their book. So sometimes I just like sit alone in my room and watch it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it does a pretty good job. Um, it makes it look a little bit more dramatic than it is, like all trailers, but I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. So I thought I would talk to you guys a little bit about how I started writing these books, um, where the idea came from, a little bit about my background. Um, so the really funny thing is that for the longest time I thought that I was a poet, <laughs> and I still sort of do. Um, so all of my training is in poetry, and one of the reasons why I had always been so interested in poetry as a genre was because um, poetry is like sort of infinitely capacious. There is no such thing as like genre demarcations in poetry, right? Like there's no sci-fi poetry or fantasy poetry or mystery poetry. There's just poetry, and as a container, you can kind of put anything into it. Um, and as somebody who grew up reading mass market fantasy paperbacks that I still love, um, and a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories, um, reading a lot of genre fiction, it really appealed to me that poetry was something that I could kind of put anything into and do anything with. And I remember telling this to one of my professors during my MFA and them saying, can't you do that with young adult? Isn't that something you can also do there? Um, because I had realized over the course of the years that I also missed telling stories quite a bit. Um, my love affair with Sherlock Holmes started because um, when I was a kid, my grandfather gave a copy of the Holmes stories to my younger brother and not to me. I got Nancy Drew. I was not a Nancy Drew fan. I was very upset. I immediately thieved his copy and then it lived in my room after that. And um, as I got older, I found myself returning to the stories again and again as a different person at different points in my life, getting different things out of them. When I was really young, um, I was really drawn to sort of the, the thrill of reading them. Um, I don't think anything in my life scared me as badly as reading The Speckled Band did when I was really young. And then um, the more I learned about the stories, the more interested I got in just, not just um, Sherlockiana itself, but also in sort of the, the fandom and mythology that have been built up around it. Um, one of the things I played around with quite a bit in a study in Charlotte was pointing out um, the inconsistencies in Doyle's stories. So the speckled band, the story that terrified me when I was a kid, is just like not possible. Um, the villain keeps the snake in a safe, but snakes need to breathe, so the snake would be dead. 
Um, he feeds the snake milk, but snakes don't drink milk. And then he calls them out with a whistle, but snakes are deaf. So like this whole snake story that I just like, you know, just had me like up until 2 a.m. shivering was just not possible. And I loved the idea of um, Sherlockians coming up with reasonings as to why there were these inconsistencies in the story. The one that Jamie comes up with when he's talking about it um, was that uh, Watson sw slept through the whole thing. And when Holmes came back, he was just sort of like not really paying attention as he was taking notes about the crime. Um, I love that idea, though, of history and documentation and ideas that there are different versions of truth. Their idea that like there can be the real truth and there can be what we wrote down, which is, of course, different because we have different perspectives on it. And then the person reading it has a different experience with that. Um, I think at heart I am uh, both a writer and an academic, and that kind of comes out in my interests when it comes to this kind of stuff. So when I was writing a study in Charlotte, one of the things I really wanted to play around with was the idea that um, my Watson is, I think, like the original Watson, a little bit of an unreliable narrator. Um, Charlotte Holmes in these books is not exactly an easy person. And um, I wrote her specifically that way, because whenever I had seen adaptations that had the girl as the genius, they tended to make her nicer and a little bit more rule following than the original Sherlock Holmes ever was. Um, and I teach gifted high schoolers in the summer. Um, and I have seen some wild, incredible, very rule-breaking girl geniuses. Um, and it didn't really seem like there were stories about them in the same way, or that we maybe expected different things from girls um, than we expected from very smart boys. So I wanted to write something for them where I mapped the original Sherlock Holmes' vices, as well as his sort of deductive powers, um, onto somebody who we don't really we're not really used to seeing them on, or we're much less comfortable, and then giving her a boy best friend who thought that she hung the moon, and then sending them off to solve mysteries. Um, so that was my impetus for writing these. I was teaching a detective fiction class um, at the University of Wisconsin, and I was doing some research on adaptation because I wanted to teach some of my favorite Sherlock Holmes adaptations uh, to the class. This is a few years ago, but I think at last count, there were 243 Sherlock Holmes adaptations. And uh, I felt both incredibly intimidated by that and also like I had just been given permission to do what I wanted with it. There's that famous Sir Arthur Conan Doyle quote um, when William Gillette wrote him in the early 20th century and asked for permission to change some of his lines in a play. And Doyle said, Holmes, you can marry him, kill him, or do anything that you like with him. And so hopefully Doyle is not many feet underground, very mad at me for what I have done with his creations. So I thought, um, yeah, well, I was going to say, I thought the best way to maybe do this would be to ask questions. Um, and I can talk at length or at short about anything you guys are interested in. And then um, I have more I can say, too. But I thought maybe I would let you lead the discussion. So. When you say 243 adaptations, um, do you mean just movie? I just mean film and, and TV adaptations. Oh, I'm sorry. I was teaching sort of screen adaptations of Holmes. So yeah, that doesn't count all the pastiches. and. And I don't even know if there's any way to, to begin counting those. Over 6,000. That's terrific. I love that. Yeah. No, um, when, we see, when we get to see the screen depictions that are so popular, um, I think, and this was, again, I think 2012 or 2013. So I, I think there are more, especially now that there are like Sherlock Holmes web series that are wonderful. There's a lot of really cool Sherlockiana out there. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, questions. I can talk about the process writing these books, or my life as a writer, or more things Sherlock Holmes. So you decided, uh, kind of because you knew a lot of very smart girls, and uh, in Sherlock adaptations, when it was a girl, a uh, mild person, <laughs> make her a little more mild. Um, had you thought about this for a long time before that? So I, I mean, I wrote the first draft of a study in Charlotte when I was supposed to be studying for my PhD qualifying exam, uh, which meant that I wrote it very quickly. It was sort of like a sneeze, like it was just happening, and then I had to push my exam back. And um, this whole book series is just like, I'm like, <laughs> I've had to, turn, to write like this 15-page critical introduction for my dissertation now for the last three years. <laughs> so I'm just blaming all of it on, on Charlotte Holmes. Um, 
But some of it was because one of my research areas is um, basically the, like the, the figure of and the idea of the detective in 19th and 20th um, century detective fiction. And so um, I was doing all of this research and reading and taking notes and like writing these like swaths of like critical articles, practicing for my qualifying exam. And I was just getting mad, like really kind of furious. Um, and I, I just like, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted to find and I've read so many Sherlock Holmes pastiches, like any sort of obsessive, like when you start going down the rabbit hole, you realize that there's no bottom, especially now with the internet. Like you can pretty much find any kind of Sherlock Holmes story that you wanted. And I'm sure that the ones that I've been writing, I'm sure I'm not the first person to like have the girl detective, but I couldn't find it exactly the way that I wanted it. So I wrote, wrote the first 40 pages of a study in Charlotte at like 2 a.m. just on like a green tea bender. Um, and then sort of kept writing it really quickly and obsessively over the next month or so. Um, ultimately, that was just a terrible first draft and it took me about a year and a half. But I had, I guess until I had thought a lot about young adult fiction, um, I hadn't really considered the idea that I could write a pastiche or a retelling and have it be a thing. In my head, I had kind of spun it as this thing that um, existed out in the world and that my take on it was something that I would write for myself or show to friends. And when I realized that I was writing it with teenage characters, because I also, some of this was that I had known that always that I'd wanted to write a boarding school series. I went to boarding school, it was really formative. It <laughs> made me and messed me up in equal measure. <laughs> And so um, I knew that that was something that I wanted to explore. Um, and as I just started putting the book together, it wasn't like I was really consciously ticking all of those boxes. But like anything else, when you're writing at a really fast clip, you start drawing a lot on things you're obsessed with and things you know really well. And so that's where a lot of it came from initially. Yeah. Why did you make the situation between Charlotte and Jamie so prickly? I mean, is it hormones? Is it the fact that she's a girl and she's a boy? I think some of it is that the other thing I have always been drawn to Holmes and Watson for is that sort of very um, intense, obsessive friendship. But when you put that on teenagers, I think it's a little bit different, or at least it was for me. So I had a boy best friend, actually said boy best friend, directed these book trailers. Um, the first book is dedicated to him. And we were sort of like exclusive, in like an exclusive romantic friendship that was a friendship. Um, I mean, we weren't dating, but we did everything together. And because we were at boarding school, it was kind of like w being weirdly like teenage married, where like come pick you up in the morning and you walk to breakfast together and then you'd have lunch together and dinner and then you'd hang out all night doing your work together and you'd go to bed. And, and it was like that for years. I still talked to him on the phone every day. Um, he's one of my favorite people. Um, but I remember that being incredibly confusing to me um, when I was still kind of get, trying to get my sea legs as to like, what is it like to be a person? It was like, if I want to spend all of my time with this person, should we be dating? Should we not be dating? Is it okay that we're not dating? Should I have a boy? Like, I don't, I, like, if I'm identifying myself so much in, like, relationship to this other person, I feel like, for me, that was kind of a confusing experience and also one that um, made me occasionally prickly to be around. Um, and also, I think was maybe a little bit, you know, I don't know. Um, I think it could look a little bit confusing from the outside. And so I really wanted to write a book about like, those kinds of really obsessive relationships that you have, especially when you're away from home and you're trying to make yourself a family in a way. I think for the two of them, um, I think Charlotte, um, teenage Sherlock Holmes, at least in my iteration, is not really at a place yet where she has figured out how to be a person in the world. I think Jamie is maybe a little bit closer to it, but she's learning. And over the course of the three books, the two of them get to a place eventually that I think is a little bit saner for the both of them. Uh, but when they are first, when they're first friends, especially in a study in Charlotte, they're being framed for murder and Jamie is like 120% panic and Charlotte is just like, I'm not gonna tell you anything, you can go ahead and panic. Um, and so I think that's their initial dynamic, though it does hopefully grow and shift over the course of the series. In terms of um, family members or dynamics or? More the dynamics. She comes to this boarding school feeling like she's a disappointment. Yeah, and in a lot of ways I think she is to her family, which is kind of astonishing. astonishing. Yeah. Um, have you read the second book? Not the second. Okay. You should read the second book. 
<laughs> the second book is sort of like, basically, like again, like when I'm writing these books, I'm just like playing in my sandbox. And when I was a kid, I used to spend all of this time being like, what was it like being a teenage Sherlock Holmes? Like, what did that look like? Um, and for me, like writing these, it was really, in it was even more interesting for me to imagine what it would be like for teenage girl Sherlock Holmes. And so, especially with the idea that like you come from a family that um, has a family business, and that's something that they um, talk about um, in the early chapters of the book. Like, what's it like? You know, some families are cobblers, and some families are lawyers, and our families, are, you know, do this this work. Um, it takes different forms. Some of them work for the government. Some of them are detectives. They do all this crazy stuff. It's slightly heightened universe um, all the way through, of course, which is really fun to play with. And so, some stuff is a little bit unreal sounding, but um, I wanted to see what it would be like to not only be incredibly terrifyingly smart and a little bit self-destructive, but to have like the weight of all of these expectations on you. I, one thing, again, um, that I remember from being a teenager and that I see my teenage students deal with quite a bit is expectation and also like inheritance. Like, how much am I like my family? How much is my family like me? Do I have to be like my parents, um, my older brother, my older sister? Like, where I'm, I'm making myself into a person, and so what ends up happening with me? over the course of that. So you chose the boarding school situation because you're familiar with that. Partially, but also because um, you have to get rid of the parents somehow if you want to write a young adult novel. And so, um, I mean, have you guys seen that wonderful comic? I forget who does it, but it's the, the, the guy who does all of the wonderful literary comics, and it's three panels. <laughs> um, in the first one, a wizard has come to the door and is like, um, your daughter is the only person who can break the curse of the Witch of Norlax. And the mother says, she can't come out until she's finished eating her vegetables. And the title of it is The Curse of the Unorphaned Young Adult Heroine. Right? I mean, and that's sort of the problem, right? If there are good parents, there's no story. Because they're like, no, you solve crimes? Like, no, go to bed. Go to bed. Do your homework. Um, and so that was something I think I had to grapple with. Also, like being on my own at 16, I made all kinds of decisions that I don't know if I would have had I still been at home. And some of them were really good, and some of them were definitely questionable. So, any other questions? Yeah. You said you started out writing the first 40 pages and just kind of uh, late at night, right? Yeah. Are, do you continue to write that way by inspiration, or are you a disciplined writer? Deadlines have made me disciplined. <laughs> Yeah, in a lot of ways. So um, the, the great thing about writing poetry is that nobody is waiting for it. <laughs> so before when I was writing poems, it would just be like, if I'm going to write a poem today, if I don't, nobody is disappointed but me. Um, and I loved, I loved that in a way, because I was also teaching quite a bit then. And I had this idea that I was maybe going to somehow be a college professor and write p these poems and, um, and, and do that. And when it became clear that um, the series was something that I was going to have to kind of write very quickly, especially for me. Um, you know, when you're writing young adult, they want the books to be able to come out um, quickly enough that, um, you know, your reader doesn't grow out of them, hopefully, by the time that they finish. And so they come out once a year. And it's sort of like that old saw where they say that you have forever to put out your first album, but your second album needs to be made in like four weeks. So I had forever to write the first book. And then I had about six months to write the second. Um, and I am a perfectionist, and I'm used to working with 70 words at a time not 80,000. And so um, it was a little bit harrowing. And I would, it would be incredibly, um, don't tell my students I don't have a schedule. <laughs> but I, I don't really have a schedule. I, try, I can't usually write for more than three or four hours a day. I kind of tap out at that point. My brain start, stops working. Um, I try to finish each writing session in the middle of a sentence so I at least know that much the next day um, when I open it back up so it's a little bit less scary. I do a lot of, I, I, I try really hard also not to end at the end of a scene so that, again, I can get back into it and start writing fairly quickly. But I really like writing. I'm, I'm kind of the weird writer who, um, I really like revising the best. I like being able to get in there, um, open it up, tinker around, close it back up, move things around. Um, I find that really satisfying. So. When you read other Change that part and emphasize over here. Um, I think, I think I do that. I, I do that with a lot of things I read. I mean, my, my my hope always when I read anything is to get lost in it. When I talk to my students about it, I call it the fictive dream. 
you know, this idea that you can just slip into it and time kind of just goes. Um, I feel like good writing, most of the time, I'm not paying attention to the writing itself. Um, so I, I like things that are, are like, um, of course, like, you know, interestingly and beautifully written, but not so much so that it takes me out of the story. I'm sort of a narrative addict, like anybody else who has been asked that question by Netflix, are you still watching? Um, that's sort of my life with, with watching things and with uh, books. I am, yes, always still watching. I'm still reading. So, yeah. What made you want to become a book author? Um, ever since I was really little, I was writing, I actually, um, from like when I was like eight or nine, have a full notebook full of poems about the X-Files, which I was watching as an eight-year-old and should not have been. And the only way I think I could deal with that was by writing poems about aliens. Um, I was a really normal kid, if you're getting that idea. Um, but I was always reading, and then what would happen, I remember, was that I would get to the end of a book and be like, okay, I'm gonna reread it 40 more times. Um, and then it would be like, I'm, I can't even like see the words anymore. It like doesn't even really exist. It's just like this rag, like I've used it up. And then I remember thinking I could write my own stories. And then it would never really have to stop in a way. But I also just really like language a lot. Um, I, it, it sounds kind of dorky, but like I love listening to people talk and um, I loved reading poetry. I was always looking for some kind of reflection of myself in the world and the easiest way I found that was through other people's words, I guess. I'm like not very musical. Um, I can't draw. I, I, I was just like sort of, um, when I was younger, it was very sort of like um, determinedly expressive. Like I needed to do something, I felt like, and, and writing was the thing for me. So, And then when I got older, it became clear that I was just no good at doing anything else. <laughs> like the way most writers, um, the advice I give my, my students always is just like, if you can do anything else, please do it. Just go do it. Like um, it is, it's, it's hard to, hard to make a living doing it and, um, and it can be incredibly frustrating because you're sort of like, everything you do is sort of made up of yourself, which is wild. Um, but yeah, I love it still, um, but it's, it's maddening for sure. FYI, the episode of X-Files and the White Buffalo mm -hmm. happened here in Jamestown. Oh really? That's amazing. That makes me really happy. <laughs> I'm gonna go home and write a poem about it. Had the white buffalo. That's great. Yeah, um, I had a big love affair with Mulder and Scully. So I guess I've always liked detectives to begin with. Although I was less on the aliens and more on the Victoriana as I got older. Other questions? Anything else I can talk to you guys about? Do you, um, do you outline, or are you just kind of a more of a discovery writer? It sounds like you were more of a discovery writer. A little bit. Well, so what happens is that I, when I'm writing a mystery. Um, especially, I like to write the first 40 pages um, and get a sense of the pacing that I want to have, like how fast are things going to happen, um, and also get a sense of the voice is really important to me too. I want it to feel really lived in. Um, and then I stop, and then I go back, and then I outline the rest of the book. Um, but if something, like if I'm writing a scene and it's really resisting what I want to do with it, you know, sometimes like, it's, it sounds nuts, but like sometimes your characters just like don't want to do the thing that you want them to do, or it's really hard, or it seems a lot more natural for you to write it a different way. So um, whenever that's happening, I'll, I, I'll go back and reconsider my outline. And there are always things too that I, I kind of leave up to, um, not chance, but like leave up to how I'm feeling that day. Like um, the last thing I ever want to do is, is write a book that feels like tightly plotted, but where the characters um, feel like they're doing things that aren't necessarily natural to them to further that plot. So um, when I'm making an arc for a mystery, what I think about first is the relationship between the characters, and then I like to write a plot that in some way mirrors like the emotional arc of those characters. So like the first book, it's fairly simple. They don't know and don't trust each other at, at all at the beginning. Um, and then you know we watch them get to a place where they do trust each other. Um, but so, of course, the, the mystery has a lot to do with secrets and people lying to each other and um, people's strange and awful motives, like most mysteries. But yeah, so that's how I, I play, plot, plight, plot, and write a mystery. Um, I guess the interesting thing about the second book for me was when I was writing the first book, again, I had no idea if or what was going to happen to it. But when I was writing the second, I knew that um, I was writing that this was going to be a trilogy, that I was going to get to write three books. And so um, the second book and the third book are sort of like one longer mystery um, in a lot of ways, where um, 
the third introduces more facets of it. But I really wanted the idea of, I really wanted to like, I guess, juggle like flaming clubs. I was like, how many can I, can I put up in the air? How, um, how, uh, how complex can we make this? And how much too um, is what we're learning about what's happening dependent on the person who's telling the story? So Charlotte has a few chapters in the last of August. And she has quite a few chapters in the third book. And so I wanted a lot of the tension from that to be like, how are people's experiences different? How do they talk about things differently? How does that work? So. Do you have future plans of writing A, a fourth book in the series, or B, creating a whole new set of characters and writing more Sherlock Holmes stories? That would be really fun. <laughs> I have to be cut off at some point, I think. Um, so <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I don't know if there's going to be a fourth book in this series. Um, I've been uh, working or like kind of beginning my next project, um, which is not Sherlock Holmes based, um, but uh, is, yeah, I don't know, on um, the next thing. But I, the, the thing about these books, the thing about I think writing a mystery series that's really fun is most of the time you can come back to the characters um, because you know it's, it's sort of not like the whole of their story, right? They're involved in, um, and these other mysteries, these cases, these things that are happening to them. Um, so yeah, I'm not writing off doing a fourth, but I'm in this weird place right now where I'm like editing the third book, and I wake up in the morning, and I feel like total despair that I'm not going to be able to keep writing in Jamie Watson's voice. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, thank god. I don't have to do this anymore. Um, not because I don't love it, but because at a certain point, like, I get worried that maybe I won't be able to write anything else. If you spend a 1,000 pages living in one character's head, um, you know, sometimes you're like, okay, what if I, like, what if I wrote a space opera? <laughs> Maybe that would be good. So, yeah. So it's sort of like Basil Rathbone doing something else after he's done the series, and no one believes him. <laughs> Hopefully, they will believe me. That's the, well, that's the hope. Any other? Who would you like Charlotte to be in the movie? Uh, actually, Emma Faithful, um, if it was going to be anybody, I think she's amazing. Um, she's actually, um, so she was Wendy in Finding Neverland on Broadway, and now she's going to be Veruca Salt in the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory musical on Broadway. Um, and she's amazing, um, but she's too busy being like the world's best dancer, actress, singer to actually do film work, and I think she's just incredible. So She looks very much like a Sherlock Holmes or a teenage girl. We really, we really lucked out with like the casting for all of this. Yeah, I mean, um, she was terrific, and I almost like there was just a lot of crying. But I almost started crying when um, we first saw the boy who was going to play Jamie because it was almost like I, he had just like somebody had just dragged him out of my head and put him in front of me. He um, is sort of perfect in a lot of ways. Like, you know, it's I, I feel really lucky because I feel like I do have the movie version and. Um, because my best friend was directing, I also got to stand there next to him. And after every take, he would be like, is that the way you wanted them to say that? Is that what you wanted them to do? Which is, of course, not the way it happens when they make the TV show. You know, they're like, we're going to make Charlotte blonde, and it's going to take place on the moon. And you're like, that's great. I have no say in this. So, yeah. What do you think of the upcoming Sherlock Holmes movies that have been projected on, uh, in, on the internet? The Oh, yeah, no, that's not really my thing. Um, uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is supposedly coming out with a third. Uh, Jude Law Watson um, has a very special, very curmudgeonly place in my heart. Um, so I will probably see those, yeah. I think there's a third. Uh, another comedy, I'm not sure. I'm thinking about we, we, we identify movies by the people who play Holmes. <laughs> Yeah, the Jeremy Brett, the Jeremy Brett Holmes was my favorite Holmes, always and forever. The 1980 series from Granada, um, and now it's on YouTube actually, which um, it's been really fun um, talking to some of my teen readers who have discovered it, um, because we just sort of sit there and sort of clasp our hands and look at each other across the table while the book signing line is behind them, um, and that's been kind of amazing. Um, yeah, I love, I love, I think actually my all-time favorite adaptation. And I usually don't say this when asked because it's, it's sort of esoteric in some ways. But um, I love the BBC Radio 4 adaptation with Michael Williams and Clive Marison. Those are my favorites. They're amazing. Um, and I listened to them when I was writing Charlotte. I still had this 45-minute commute to and from to teach. And um, it was exactly the length of one of those episodes. And so I would listen to it. And I would just sort of wander in in this like gaslit daze. And then I would 
have to teach creative writing, and I'm sure <laughs> seemed very out of it while I was doing so. But, um, but yeah, I love those. Those are terrific. So, yeah. Yeah? Any ideas for any future books besides the series? Or? Yeah, so I'm actually co-writing a book with one of my friends um, who is a YA writer. Her book, The Love That Split the World, came out last year, and it's amazing. Her name is Emily Henry, um, and that is a secret. Um, and then I'm writing a book by myself, which I'm also not allowed, allowed to say anything about. So basically, it's I have the worst answer to your question. <laughs> um, so, and, and also, I don't know necessarily um, if or what is going to happen with these things. They could also, like so many things, go poof at any minute. Um, and so um, we'll see. But I update my Twitter as soon as I have news. So if you follow me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I'm skipping stones across all platforms because there is a Brittany Cavallaro out there who beat me to the punch on everything. I didn't know that there were many of us, but apparently we are legion, so. Do you have a favorite show from Spartan? Musgrave Ritual. Yeah, uh, that's always been my favorite. Um, although, Dying Detective has really grown on me recently. The more time I spend with it, I find it like, it's like one of those stories. So um, I think the Sherlock BBC did something with it in their fourth season. Um, their Culverton Smith was Toby Jones, who was very scary. Um, although, of course, the story is kind of put into a blender the way they do it. but. Um, it's like a, a story about trust in a lot of ways, where Holmes is like, seems just completely off his nut um, and is ordering Watson to do bizarre things. And of course, they all have a purpose. But for you know, the length of the story, Watson is just like, I trust you. Holmes is like, let me rant at you about oysters and then ask you to go hide in this wardrobe. Watson's like, cool, I can do that. And um, I loved that, especially when I was a kid. Um, and I love it a lot now, too. It's something that I find myself returning to when I'm thinking about Jamie and Charlotte and writing these books, so, yeah. Um, anyway, this has been a lot of Sherlock Holmes talk for the uninitiated, but um, I highly recommend The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. They are wonderful. They are very fast reads. Most of them are quite short. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, when I, was, when I first started writing this series, I remember thinking that my ideal world would be if somebody picked up one of these and then read a Doyle story. Um, and then I could talk to them about all of the weird inconsistencies. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway. The, the Sherlockian world of uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, the uh, uh, original three worshippers, Brock County, of which we two are members, and all the other hundreds of Sherlockian groups in the United States and around the world just love to spend their time on the inconsistencies of the stories. You know, with Watson shot in the shoulder, like he said in the first story. Or in the leg. I like the BBC Sherlock being like, oh, he has some psychosomatic pain. There's nothing actually wrong with his leg, but he was shot in the shoulder. I was like, OK, you can do that. That's good. Um, yeah, no, I go to birthday weekend, which is sort of the like, for the uninitiated, is kind of like the big national Sherlock Holmes do in New York in January. I didn't get to go this year. Um, but last year, just found myself like discussing the finer points of like, electricity in London in the 1890s for a very long time. And I just, um, I had brought a friend with me um, who'd very gamely kind of come as my date. And afterward, he was like, I am so happy that that made you happy. <laughs> and it made me very happy. So yeah. Sorry? Oh, no, I haven't done that one. But I was, um, I did the. I did the BSI brunch. I do the like daintiest thing under a bonnet ball, which is really fun. Um, yeah, um, it's good. I have a girl Sherlock costume that I've had forever. Um, this is just like me, just <laughs> waving my flag all over the place. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very dear to me. Yeah. Um, you started writing at a young age. Do you have re recommendations for um, people that might like to get into writing? Um, courses they could take. Yeah, for sure. So I really like what Neil Gaiman says that um, if you are writing quite a bit when you first start out and you find yourself um, overwhelming, overwhelmingly frustrated by what you're writing and you're displeased with it, it's because your taste level is still more advanced than your skill level. But the only way to get to the place where those two things can match up is if you keep going. Um, and ultimately, too, if you want to be a writer, you have to also love the writing. Um, and it, that sounds like a really kind of silly or obvious thing to say, but it's not always fun. Um, but you have to be able to get to the point whenever you are writing when you feel like, OK, like, 
there's a moment here where I was just lost, and that was amazing. Or maybe that happens for you in revision. Um, I know a lot of writers, too, who don't like writing but love having written. I guess that counts, too. Um, and there are days definitely where I feel like that. But if you're a younger writer, I think, um, I mean, I was really kind of academically driven. And um, it wasn't really until I just sort of like, I did the extreme thing. I did, took the nuclear option where I went to a creative writing boarding school um, so I could just do it all the time. Um, but, um, you know, there are wonderful summer programs. There's this one through Northwestern that I teach at where I have high school students who come board and I teach them for three to five weeks. Um, and it's all day and I teach it like a college writing workshop and my students go off to publish novels, which is cool. Um, I think that making time for it and also making time to read voraciously the way you want to. Um, you can't be a good writer, I don't think, without also being a really passionate reader. And when I was younger, I used to think that maybe I wasn't going to be a real writer because I will read anything, anything. I mean, and my particular poison for a long time was really bad books about dragons. And so um, I was like, oh, I'm not like, I'm not like sitting around reading Hawthorne. Like, I, <laughs> I have no future. Um, I don't know. I, I, I love reading literary fiction, but I also just love reading. Um, and I think that if it's something you love, it's never really going to leave you. And if you love it that much and you want to put more of it into the world, you can do that. And also, most, of, most people are not full-time writers. So if you're not a full-time writer while you're writing, you are in very good company. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I also, I tell a lot of my, my, my students or people who ask me, like, the, the, the best thing that you can do if you want to be a writer is to love to teach, because it's what most of us end up doing, too. And I do love teaching. And I'm in a place now where um, I can kind of balance it so that I write more, and so when I teach, I really appreciate it, because I'm um, not doing it as much as I used to. But yeah, if you love it, you can, you can definitely find time for it, I think. If you become a New York Times best-selling author, I, I don't, I, yesterday I woke up from a nap. I was dreaming about Cadbury chocolate eggs. Um, I had had a very long flight <laughs> and I apparently wanted sugar and I was staying with my parents in Chicago um, for my Chicago event. It was good to do that because I had been traveling so much sort of on my own. And um, I woke up to a call from my editor who, you know, generally we don't speak on the phone. You don't usually with your editor, at least send emails. Um, and. I had this moment where I was like, I just want to keep dreaming about the chocolate. And I, so I picked, up, I picked up the phone. And I said, hello. And she was like, are you sleeping? She was like, wake up. You're on the New York Times list. Um, and that's a crazy thing. That is just like a crazy phone call. And I got to do the thing where I went downstairs. And um, I had a graphic of the list. And I got to give it to my, my father. And he like, put on your glasses. Can you tell me what number four says? Can you just read that one out loud to me? Uh, which was a great moment. But, it, the thing is, with, with like anything else, you wake up the next morning and like, you're still gonna do the next thing that you did that day. You know, like I, I woke up, I talked to a whole bunch of eighth graders this morning. I got a coffee. Um, I read one of the um, the Colleen Gleason Stoker and Holmes novels, and then I came here. Um, and my life is ex almost exactly the same as it was yesterday. It's just always, it's like that too with publishing a book. It's uh, it's, it's good, and it's 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 weird. Um, I have to keep reminding myself that this happened. So, yeah. Any other questions? I can sign books. That sounds good to you guys. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.